So you're the CEO and founder of Prospero AI, a company that has grown 50X, I saw on, I believe, a LinkedIn post since you started it, uh, which was only in the past year or so, correct? It was 50X in, in, in the prior six months. It's actually 66X as of last month. We, we've we grown a little, I mean, we were growing a little slow and now it's uh, taken off uh, a lot. So uh, we owe that to social media and people just kind of spreading the word about us. Yeah, congratulations on that. That's great. So you described the company as machine learning on a mission to make finance fair and prosperous for everyone. So can you explain a little bit of your background before starting the company and why you wanted to start it in the first place? Yeah, sure. So I started, uh, I worked at my first value hedge fund when I was 17 years old. I actually taught myself accounting to get that job. And I worked for a pretty prominent business school professor, Bruce Greenwald, uh, Columbia Business School the summer before, and he kind of helped me uh, get into the space. Uh, and and from the start, I kind of wanted to make finance uh, a little more fair uh, because I thought that, you know, I grew up in New York City and I thought a lot of the things that that I saw, um, especially working at places like I did like 06 at Bear Stearns as my career went forward and, and I worked in mortgage finance for that. Uh, my idea of making finance more fair kind of got a, a little stronger as I saw it from the inside. Uh, and when I was 25, I actually set out to uh, kind of be a Robin Hood type, not like Robin Hood, the broker that takes advantage of people, but like the actual Robin Hood before that even existed. And my idea was to create a uh, what I was calling an arbitrage machine that was more of a uh, charitable hedge fund. Um, but it's kind of funny. I was an idealist 25 year old uh, and I didn't know that a lot of uh a lot of people already had the idea to to build arbitrage machines. Uh, that's you know places like Renaissance Technologies, Bridgewater, uh, that are household names now. Um, but it took a while for them to get them there, especially like their their kind of quant abilities um, have spread a lot more as kind of knowledge of technology has grown. Um, and so my idea kind of uh, moved along. Uh, and what was interesting as I got to know. Uh, the hedge fund industry more. And, and, and a lot of my career before this, uh, when I started my first company, was just building out um, custom predictive pipelines for financial institutions. So I did everything from, you know, mortgages to college loans. I did equity uh, index ads for actually McGraw-Hill Financial, so S&P. Um, and my last project, I did a huge, uh, I, I predicted for BNP Paribas um, every a uh, client ice and pair for their entire fixed income book. So a hundred million rows a day. Um, and what I realized in all of these projects was how much more dependent hedge funds were becoming on retail data or data generated by, by retail investors. Um, things like real-time credit card swipes, camera data, satellite images, a lot of point of sale stuff. And that actually gave me the, the you know genesis of Prospero which is basically like, well, if there's a way to earn the trust of retail investors, and my idea to do that was basically give away really high quality predictive systems for free in a way that was easy for them to consume and adapt, um, as well as a process for them to succeed with that, then we could go down the road and in the app, we kind of ask people to donate their data and it's all voluntary. People choose exactly what they want. So it's kind of the opposite of how it exists today where nobody really has any idea how much they're giving and they don't give consent. So the idea is we can build along this way. And if we scale enough, we could actually build a better data set than hedge funds buy uh, against people's will. Um, and what's interesting about the platform is uh, originally it was really built just to be honest. And when I say honest, I mean like we talk about like our most popular metric and what people kind of check the app for every day. And a lot of, you know, how we made, uh, there was a big, you know, thing that we published that was a 50% profit from when we started doing our newsletter picks in September to the end of last year. A lot of that was just using net option sentiment. But what was interesting about that is I really just invented it because too many people, retail investors, which I talk to every day, basically said, I don't understand how to read an options chain. And I was kind of beating my head against the wall, trying to trying to teach it to them. And one day I just kind of frustrated to one person said, what if I told you the options markets like this or did it like it? And they said, that would be a lot easier. 
So that's an example of a metric that we just built to have a more honest portrayal of what was going on in the options markets, especially like where institutions were pricing options, which is a big difference between, I would say, our net option sentiment and like a put call ratio or anything that you can kind of get anywhere, is that a lot of it is my expertise in building out actually a linear equation for the direction of uh, basically differences in how puts and calls are priced above and below where the stock is trading. Um, so I would say that that's how the platform was really built. A lot of it was just that we wanted to honestly portray some pretty complex, um, some pretty complex concepts and, and, and put it all in one place. Um, but yeah, I, I think a lot of that's, that's how a lot of it is growing. Um, because, you know, there's other things that we're doing that, you know, while also honest, has some really heavy machine learning in it, like our upside and downside breakout. Um, and actually before I built all the short-term signals, kind of, as I said in that example, by giving retail investors something to just make their lives easier specifically, um, upside breakout and downside breakout were built just to visualize the difference between, you know, how much you could expect a stock to go up a lot or down a lot. And obviously sometimes you could be high in both because there's a lot of volatility risk, but you can kind of measure risk in all different kinds of ways by using that if one's high and one's low, one's low and one's high, you know, they're both about the middle, which means there's no heavy institutional bets on either side. Um, and in those specifically, there's, you know, there's nonlinear models. We layer in a lot of like price targets, analyst ratings, momentum factors, all kind of wrapped into single upside and downside metrics. So those are just like a quick, I'm sure you're gonna have questions, but that's just like a quick run through of, as I say, what would make us most unique. Um, and then some of the other things are just like, in terms of the fact that we have 10 metrics, we just want to make sure they can come to one place and understand kind of all the risks, all the upsides and downsides across the board, both short and long-term in a simple to easy, you know, easy to see two graphs side by side. Um, so we can even be kind of like a one-stop shop for research. To summarize that, if I'm understanding, you think Prospero's main function or value driver to a retail investor would be analyzing a large swath of data and condensing it into an easy to understand charter graph or newsletter or piece of information that they might not be able to understand or even get all of the access to that, all of that data. Yeah, absolutely. Like we have things like our net option sentiment that are just like completely unique and you can't find anywhere else. But then that's kind of wrapped in these packages of, you know, what we call, what we kind of say on a high level is we're simplifying things while also making them more information rich uh, than you know a lot of other things out there. So I think that's that's the really cool thing about Prospero. You're getting more powerful things um, conveyed to you in simpler ways with easy educational resources by the side. Like there's a help file that you can click, and basically it's no more than two minutes of reading to be able to understand how any of our signals work, which is which is great if you compare it to like even something like you read about you know, earnings per share, or EBITDA or something that requires some accounting knowledge to learn, like you're lucky if you can learn it in a few hours. And so that intimidates most people. So yeah, we're trying to both simplify and bring more powerful information to people. But otherwise, I think what you said is exactly right. Okay. Yeah, I personally love the newsletter you guys put out. You guys are prospero.ai. So how are you using AI? What do you think the future of AI will be on the stock market? I mean, I think it's really interesting. And I think... um well, the future is here for AI and the stock market. That's the thing. It's like, I, I guess the 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 better the, like the the better way to answer it is like, what's the future for AI and retail? Because mm -hmm. like some of the most advanced AIs are already like mechanized uh, against retail investors, and you even have places like um, Citadel that are known to hire psychologists beyond their computer scientists. So like when you see you know a stock moving in candles in a way that like is, you know, is is basically like killing your spirit. That's actually by design. Like they they have some of those algorithms are actually built to make you unhappy about your investment, even if it's about to go up. So there's some like, you know, not only very advanced like trading, um, planning algorithms, uh, you know, optimization, there's actually psychological algorithms built into those things as well. Um, and one more thing kind of before I transition to um, retail, like I think some people kind of think of this like they, they personify 
AI sometimes. And they're like, oh, like Citadel's out to get me or this is out to get me or like, but a lot of them actually use things called multi-agent frameworks. So it's actually like swarm intelligence. Not all hedge funds work like this. I could go into how every different hedge fund works, but that would be a whole YouTube thing. Um, but a lot of them, a lot of them use called multi-agent frameworks where you basically have these organisms that are relatively simple, that are just their task is to trade, you know, maybe a certain stock or groups of stocks or an industry or just trade an index. Um, and basically they like, quote unquote, live and die by how successfully they do that. Or, you know, the better way to look at like living and dying is like they acquire resources based on how successful they are. So sometimes retail investors like take these things kind of personally in terms of like their interactions with things. And I'm always just like, well, you know, especially if you're trying to like fight institutions on your own, um, that's like being like, you know, that, that's going to like a fight with giants and robots and like, you know, swarms of giant robots and being upset that you're showing up with your sword and you're losing, you know, like what we like to think of it and how we like build things like net option sentiment and even upside breakout and downside breakout that looks at long-term things. We're trying to show you how to like walk in the shadows of, you know, the giants, not try and fight them. And the bottom line is until we Prospero reaches our larger goals, which I think that's really what's good about Prospero. We give people help today. And then we also say, if you build this platform with us, we're giving you a chance to build a better future and a chance where, where the community can get better data than hedge funds can buy. And we can beat them long-term. We can be our own giant together. Um, but there's a road to get there. Um, but in terms of like AI, like, you know, I would think that there's going to be more and more um, generative AI in finance, um, where, you know, even something like, let's say a Schwab assistant, like might be kind of directing you down these learning paths that it's trying to like collect information from you. Like just in terms of generative AI, I think that's the thing, but I think what people really have to watch, have to watch out for, um, is like, you know, places like Robinhood that use a lot of AI, you know, basically to front run your trades. And for people that don't know what front running is, basically when you buy something on Robinhood, like you're not actually buying that stock. You're basically like putting in an order. And then if there's enough orders, what Robinhood will basically do is like, let's say you, you put it in like a market order and it's trading at like $3 and 50 cents. You know, a bunch of people can put it in. And by the time your trade it's executes, They'll let an institution an institution get in at 350, and then they're executing you at 375, and that's what you pay at Robinhood. Like small amounts on every trade, just because they're like AI is basically seeing what kind of institutions they can gather. And the institution is just like trading in and trading out of that. Like ultimately, like buying and selling to you, making an institute instantaneous profit. That's why 33% of uh Robin's Hood, Robin Hood's revenue comes from Citadel and Citadel routes about 50% of the trades um, on the whole market. Uh, so those are like places that AI is, is there today. Um, but yeah, I would say what people really have to watch out for is things like who, like where it is ultimately going. Because I think there'll be more and more like AI traders that are basically like giving you like the same types of things we promise, like hedge fund level, like investing. There's a competitor called Delphia that uh, that basically like, you know, I suspect of stealing our marketing on a number of occasions um, about our ethos. But what they're doing is they're basically saying, we'll give you hedge fund level market, like market intelligence, but they're actually just selling a better, they're, they're grabbing your data, they're asking for your data, but not like us, they're asking you to like, blindly share like banking information and stuff. And basically they're selling a better hedge fund than you get to like institutional investors. And they say, oh, this is how we make our money. We're giving it to you for free. Some people are wise to that, some people aren't. And I think that's something that people have to like really watch out for. Cause even places like Betterment and Wealthfront have institutional products that they're basically selling you an inferior one. And like, that's something that obviously is very different about us because from the beginning, we're giving our very best metrics to customers. And like our long-term plan is to create a hedge fund for the people and also a high yield savings account. So basically like 
we will be able to offer people either a safe high return where they don't assume the risk or they can assume the risk with us um, and invest in like our hedge fund with the unique data generated by the community. And that's really how we plan to make a lot of our money, but we won't be selling a better hedge fund you know, to anyone else. We want to scale users. We will make our money by having a small fee from a lot of people. But like just by virtue of the fact that we're being clear that we're not making our money off institutions and we never plan to, like I'd say that that's the big thing that people have to watch out for in terms of like when, you know, you're able to access great AI because a lot of the times all that that means is like you're being, you are still the product, much like Robinhood. Like we say our company, the users are our partners, not our product, but you know, there, that is, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there'll be more of that coming where there'll be, you know, much like Delphio, where there'll be, you know, places like being like, oh, we have these great returns. You can have them, you know, maybe give us your data too. But like, again, that's the same like honeypot that Robinhood is offering where they make it seem like you're getting, you're getting this great product when in, in turn you actually are the product and you're being sold to institutions. So I have uh, two questions following that. So it seems like you have some like amazing info inside information on hedge funds since you've been at one in the past. And so you talked about how they have such a level of control over a stock that they can manipulate the candles basically to trigger someone to, I guess, sell out or buy something before they even would in the first place, just to use their emotions. So are separate hedge funds working together on that? Or is it like one will choose which stock they want to go after and then work alone. And then also I have another question. It seems like data, people's data is almost the most valuable thing in the world because it's what's driving all of these trades and all of this action. Do you think one day people will ever get paid for sharing their data? Yeah, I mean, that's what Prospero is trying. Like, like I, 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 think, I think what they should worry about, and I'll go back to your other question, but I think the second one is much more important. I think what they should worry about is building an institution like we're trying to build, where they contribute their data and someone actually wants to partner with you. That's what the worry is. Because there are people that will pay you crumbs for your data. Even now, like they'll be like, oh, we'll give you like $7 a month for sharing this. Or Delphi is like, we'll give you free hedge fund access that's really just like inferior access. Like people will throw you crumbs left and right already, and they will continue to throw your crumbs. And if you think about a bank, that's that's their main game. Like, and they're still like, they barely just got rid of overdraft fees. Like now they're being like, oh, we should actually have to like, you know, uh, we actually have to not treat people terribly or they'll go to these like newer banks. But banks games are data. Like that's what they really want from you. Your spending habits, everything. That's how they form their economic models. That's been a game for longer than hedge funds have been pulling like real-time credit card swipes and everything. The game is data. The value of data is going up. So that's the big thing. Like, yeah, people can get paid for your data. You can get paid for your data now. But I would like, and there's not, not just Prospero, I would care about ethos. I would I would do a serious evaluation and I would ask, I would ask questions like, how are they making, how are they making their money? How do they plan to make their money? And if it's if it's today they're making their money from institutions, huge red flag. <laughs> and like if you're unconvinced of like their long-term vision and if they're really, you know, committed to the mission, and that's why we give away these free predictions because. We want to say, look, we're doing it now when we have no money. <laughs> like, you know, like I'm funding the company largely myself. Some of my co-founders, we've taken like small angel investments, that kind of thing. So that's the thing. Like we're doing it now when our resources are the most finite. So that's how we prove that. And I would encourage to just make sure people like also make sure that like, okay, if you think a company has a good ethos, how are they proving it to you? Do they walk the walk or are they just like, are they just trying to trap you and get you in and like, you know, sell you, you know, sell your information basically. Um, now in terms of hedge funds, like the thing that I dispel all the time and I think retail investors just don't understand is there's no conspiracy against them. Retail investors, like if there's an easy way to like take advantage of a large group of them, hedge funds will take that all day long. But do you know who hedge funds care about? Other hedge funds. That's their real competition. Like they're not trying like, sure, they will be aligned on trades where they'll agree, right? And they'll say, we expect this stock to go up. And like, to your point, like I don't like to use the word manipulation because like if they want a stock to go up, 
they want a stock to go up. It's not like, you know, they might want to drive down the price of a stock to get people out of it, to acquire it at a lower price, like, you know, short it down. Like a lot of the times institutions will short down a stock they want to buy, right? I wouldn't call that manipulation. I would try, I would call that like trying to get a stock at a better price using those psychological tactics to get people to sell. But it's not just like, they're not just doing it for the fun of it because they like hate retail investors. Like something I say to retail investors all the time is like, don't jump into shark infested waters and like be surprised when you get bit. Like, you know, everyone knows like Wall Street is the toughest game out there. And like, you know, people all the time, like I, I, I use this analogy once I have a smaller group of retail investors that I kind of talk to every day. That's like my inner circle um, because I just want to collect their information on like what they're thinking and everything like that. And like, I explained it like this. It just like, I don't hear people complaining about um, when people uh, are in first class on a plane or take a private jet or whatever. There's just like, I'm not saying that's fair, but America's kind of unfair, right? Who told you that you got to have the same execution on a trade as someone with like a million dollars, a billion dollars? Like this country is built on unfair advantages. And what most people don't even know about dark pools is that they were actually built to be more transparent because companies used to transact those big block trades privately and they were completely dark. At least in a dark pool, like you could actually like see the transactions. Is it the most fair thing? No, but like we're never promised fairness. Like the day everything else is fair, like, sure, let's single out like Wall Street. But I, I, I would say that like, you know, trading is still something I would say that's more fair than a lot of things. And like, it would be the thing that you would expect to be the least fair. Because like, honestly, it is like the game. Uh, it's the like, I think it's the toughest game you can play. It's one of the toughest, like, you know, people talk about building AI models and how tough they are. Because like, you can build an AI model that uh, for self-driving car, they're like near a hundred percent now because it's a closed system. And, you know, basically like a news event, nothing like that is gonna move it. Like the best AI models, like year after year, you're lucky if you get 55%. Like on an AI model, the best hedge funds, like that's viewed as like a world-class number. 51% is still really good. So I think that's actually one of the ways why we built Prospero the way we built it. Because like, I actually first built it for, um, to show probabilities of success and things like that. And like, some people didn't really like that. And some people expected it to like be a lot higher, even though I was serving them like world-class models, they couldn't understand that. So that's part of the way we built it. What we did where we say, we want to improve people's win rates. We just want to make people give, expose people information to different information on risks. So they just become better. And that became an easier bar to meet um, because I do think we improve things for most people. And I'll, I'll, you know, I'm sure you'll have some follow-ups from what I just said, but like, that's the one thing that is like very important to us and how we make it, you know, more fair. Um, and I talked about like, you know, kind of the bigger game of like hedge funds, like competing with each other for capital. And what's funny about what's working for us right now, like you think about like net option sentiment and then a lot of what's in net option sentiment is, is embedded in upside breakout and downside breakout, probably like our three, the three metrics I'm most proud of. Um, and I would say our best working ones. Um, and basically since we're following institutions and I don't know if you looked at our case studies, but there's a number of case studies that like where we're in it, like Alibaba, Tesla, um, Melicabra Libre, where like our metrics are going up in option sentiment or other ones um, before uh, the price movements. And I don't know if you saw our banking one, but that was pretty cool too. Mm -hmm. We basically saw a bunch of like, yeah, maybe our downside breakout on these stocks, like heading up um, before the price went down, a few days before the price went down. And essentially we're building a, we're, we're building a system where people are able to see where these bets come in. And what's funny is like, we are unabashedly saying we're just following institutions you know, for the most part, for our most metrics, like we layer in other stuff, but like, we're not ashamed to say, 
we're just amalgamating opinions of people that have more inside information, better technology than us, you know, because we are still a small team. I've worked on this for a long time, but like, you know, you look at something like Bridgewater, they have hundreds of engineers that have worked on it and continue to. So we're just leveraging the amalgamation of those opinions. And when you get back to like what the real game is for institutions, like, and what's kind of funny about where we're at is they could never do what we do because the first question you get as an institution is like, what are you doing uniquely? Like, and that's why they can't pursue the same strategy that we can because they can't say we're copying everybody else. Because if they said that, no one would put their money in on the more important game, which is uh, gathering institutional dollars. And that's the big thing where it's just like, why our, why our system works too? Because when we have like a net option sentiment, right? If the price starts to change, like because like retail investors are like trickling in smaller dollars, like our recommendations will change, you know, in close to real time. But if an institution has to deploy like $200 million, they're going to move the price, especially the price of options. And that doesn't happen because we're dealing with small dollar, you know, small dollar investors that aren't going to move it. So that's actually one of the reasons why it works. And we can always recommend such good things because by the time, you know, enough people start to move in slowly, our recommendations move. Um, but yeah, like that also like to close the loop on your institution thing. And like their goal is like to compete for dollars, like, Eventually, and everybody says you can't like keep going at a very high return, essentially, or you're going to like have bad years and everything like that. But a big reason for that is that institutions do target each other. Like if someone is trading too well, like institutions absolutely will team up on other institutions and they'll say, oh, this guy's getting too big for his britches. Like I'm going to start shorting investment studies in, I'm going to pick the weaker ones and go after those. So that absolutely no question happens. Um, but yeah, I think any time a retail investor has an investment that goes wrong for them, um, they kind of just like single out and they're like, oh, the institutions are against us. But like, no, like you're just, you're just battling giants and sometimes they step on you, but it's not because they were trying to step on you. It's just because they have bigger things on their mind and retail can't really move a stock in the same way as like, even if you're deploying the same capital, a high frequency trader can ex can move the price that much more effectively than that. And the bottom line is a lot of people trade on things like Robinhood and Webull and things that use payment for order flow. So your, your money is going even less in those places because you're basically like, submitting those trades to institutions that can fill the orders however they want to, to move the price however they want to. So you're actually feeding into their ammunition when you're in a broker like that. Such a ruthless game. So I remember like last year or so they were thinking about maybe banning payment for order flow. Would you be for that? Or do you think they should keep it? I am absolutely for it. But like the thing that I always like, uh, I always uh, caution against with people is like they ban naked shorting in 08, right? And that hasn't stopped, you know, where it went, where those orders are being filled, how they're getting keep like I could I could give any number of theories and you know, I don't really like to speak on that um, on it on something that's being blasted out in the internet uh, because lawyers are very aggressive on this stuff. Um, but you know, that's what I caution against. Like I, I'm saying I'm all for it. I'd love to see it, but like everything I know about wall street, like being around it. And like, I have a lot of friends and relatives that still like work on wall street. Um, I grew up in New York. I'm still in New York. Um, so like they will always figure out a new way. Like if people want things to be better, retail investors have to educate themselves. And that's one of our approaches. That's why we lead with education. That's the only way out of this. The government is not saving you. Like if you ever want to like be truly nauseated by something, go back and watch the Goldman Sachs hearings after the mortgage meltdown, 
where it's just like those senators looked like idiots. And I'm sure they studied, but the Goldman Sachs people were just like running circles around that. And that's like something that you just like, to, you you might understand it, but until you watch that video, um, you don't really like, it, it doesn't really dawn on you like how much smarter of a person that like you're like these, these Wall Street people are than like the people trying to regulate them. And I'm sorry, there's plenty of smart people at the SEC. I'm not saying anyone, I'm just kind of saying like, on a broad level. So like retail has to stop thinking someone's gonna come in and save them. Like they need to get smarter. You can definitely get smarter by using Prospero. Like I would recommend every single person do what I did and learn value investing. Books like Fooled by Randomness, uh, The Intelligent Investor, Ray Dalio's Principles. Like those are three that are just like must reads. And like, that's the way out of this. Like. There's no, the government is not ever going to help you. And like everything that I've seen about laws is like, A, everybody in the SEC, FINRA, all those places, their their closest friends are people at hedge funds and everything. So if they're not getting outright like, hey, like, so it comes from a noble place. I don't want to just like be uh, like totally like pessimistic here, like, the capital markets make this country move more than anything else. So the regulators definitely want to say before they pass some new thing is like, is this going to kill trading? Is this going to kill capital flow? So that's a conversation that just happens, but they're having those conversations with finance leaders. So everybody knows what's coming. At the very least, they know what's coming through the pipes. Like at the very least, they figured out how to make all the trades that they want anyway. They're figuring out their new ways around. What are they, what are they going to do? So there's like, yes, payment for order flow is terrible. Um, but like public, for example, makes a big deal of like, we don't do payment for order flow, but they automatically turn on securities lending for everyone. And most people don't know that. And they're just lending out their securities. So for like other funds to short like this, like, oh, we care about you broker is just like making everybody, like all of these people complicit in shorting stocks. A lot of them would probably hate that if they knew that. So there's always like, there's always some angle and like, yeah, like I, I don't, I think it would help like um, in some ways just to like have these better laws. Like the big thing for me would be like settlement and delivery. Like, I don't think we'll ever get that, but basically like, you know, some kind of like maybe using blockchain technology, um, like, security transfer when there's a trade so everyone we could see some kind of physical um you know they used to send stock certificates they don't anymore but like that is i think the biggest thing in things like naked shorting and all like that because like when you trade you're not trading real certificates anymore there's like delayed settlement where you can like basically like churn even if you do deliver something physical you could churn it 20 times over by the time you've like delivered the security so like, that's the big thing that if I saw something that would actually like be the biggest help, but I doubt any, I doubt anyone wants to do that. Like they don't like the physical delivery and they like basically like, obviously I don't know how much you know about leverage, but the, the, the more, the less regulation they have on delivery and settlement, um, the easier it is to lever your trades and churn your trades and that kind of thing. So you mentioned blockchain. Do you think Prospero will, will ever add crypto guidance or any kind of crypto information or data into your app or a newsletter? Yeah, it's definitely on our roadmap. I mean, the big thing is like, I actually was at, I, I'm, I'm very interested in Web3. Um, and I was at um, Google Cloud's web, big Web3 conference um, Actually, this was right after uh, the the FTX blow up. So it was very interesting and there was a lot of conversations. And And I don't know if you know the company Chain Analysis, um, mm -hmm. but I, I saw one of the founders speak um, and it was super, it was it was very interesting the way that he talked about it. And like the, the way that he described it was just basically like, oh, like you can watch everything. And like, I could actually go back. He said, I could go back and I could see like, all of the like shadiness that was happening. But he's like, it's a search problem. I can't like run through every broker and like go through all their transactions. Like, yeah, now when, when one blows up, um, 
But I found that to be very interesting because there is this transparency like promise. Um, but yeah, like I actually had like marathon at one point, marathon and riot, like recommended in some ways in Prospero. And I did a deep dive and I, so my essential, my, my problems with it, and I'll get back to it on investment. Like, I don't think, um, like the gas fees and all the transactions, I actually tried to go through as a true value investor. Like I tried to mine, I tried to stake, like, I actually think, um, that's too far away at this point now, like to, for, for where I'd like it to be like, cause I found it too complicated. And my friend that's a better engineer than me. And I'm a pretty good engineer, like had to walk me through every step. And eventually I was like, I I'm not doing this. Like, like, this is just like, I ended up losing like uh, a couple hundred dollars, just like trying to move my thing around, just like try to move it around to stake. And I was like, no, I don't want to do this. This is, this is not fun. Um, but like driving at your other point, um, there's no transparency on option. Like, and to me, that's a non-starter to put in Prospero. If I can't see like universally where options bets are being made, and that kind of brings us full circle to the dark pool, where it's like where you could actually at least see it, like you might not like it, <laughs> but at least it's there. Um, and at least people can access it and see prints and things like that. Um, but you just can't see the options. And I, I can't in good conscience, like, I don't care what the momentum factors are on like the price of Bitcoin and where the price is. If I don't know where people are making levered bets, which are the most important ones, like I can't put forth a, a, a prediction I can stand by. Can you talk about the dark pool a little bit more? Because people hear that term and they get super anxious. I mean, is that where you're getting most of this institutional information that you're gathering from? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 one of the signals. Like a lot of it is just like market data and like the actual prices. Uh, but obviously we have a, obviously we have a, a dark pool um, rating. Um, so yeah, we're, we're getting dark pool information. Um, but yeah, it's just, um, what I don't like about it is that anyone can't get on it. I don't like that. And they claim like, they claim like, oh, it's like for protection. These are institutional trades. And like that to me is BS. Like anyone should be able to like see the trades coming through on the dark pool themselves and not have to pay for it. That's what I don't like about it. But, you know, some people like, it is a way to transact in large quantities, right? And to like get, you know, get your price, not have to deal with certain kinds of like, you know, broker fees or certain like transactors. Like, you know, in a way, it's also a way to do like what we said, to know your counterpart, right? Like, let's say you do want to sell, like, let's say you have a $10 million, like a 10 million share stake in a company, right? And like, you could put those million shares up and sell them to whoever. And you could also put like, um, you could also put, uh, uh, require the whole order to be filled, right? So so not just like pick that. Um, but uh, some people, like, let's say if you're long a stock, you might actually want to know who bought your shares, right? And you might actually want to know like if they plan to hold or what their plans are. So like that's something that you can do on the dark. You could just be like, I want to sell a million shares to someone I know who I know is going to hold it. I'm going to put it at this price. And like chances are if they're looking at the dark pool on that moment, they're going to snag it at that price. So you can know who you're selling to. Um, you could do that on the general market. Like I, I don't necessarily support the dark pools existing um but i'm also realistic and like i want to say like you know maybe they don't want to do it on the general market like i i don't want to comment on like what might happen if those weren't there or they didn't have those options but i don't think it necessarily should exist but i think it's better than the system they had before where it was just like private transactions so i see that I see that as a step, I see that as a step up. Um, but yeah, like I honestly think an easy solution would be just like letting anyone that wanted to, to be able to like sign up for the exchange, like make a bid if they wanted to. If they can't afford it, they can't afford it. But like, that would be my big change where it's just like, yeah, I totally get being on an exchange that's just like not as crowded with information. And you could just like, it's easier for you to make these like large block trades without, you know, all the noise, so to speak. And also like having a higher degree of confidence that you, that you know your counterparty 
but yeah, like that, that would be my big thing. I don't really see any reason for, I don't see any reason why anyone shouldn't be able to just like sign up and be able to like, look at what's going on there, you know, even bid if they want to. So shifting a little bit into a little bit more macro, obviously there's a lot going on with the banks with several failing in the past several weeks and a lot of fears about commercial real estate I'm hearing now. So can you share some of your opinions on maybe if the worst is behind us or what the future could hold? I'm optimistic on the stock market, um, much more than I was um, before before the banks. Um, and, and what I'm hearing from like my contacts around Wall Street is that just like, it was a big capitulation. Like, I think they're walking it back a little bit now, but basically I think the plan was absolutely, you know, there were some rumblings of even maybe like a 0.5% rate increase because inflation proved to be like a little stickier. Um, but I do, and then at this meeting, like Powell, I forget what it was exactly, but he like changed his language and he even like corrected himself because he was using new language. Um, but I think we could, I, I, I think we could be done with the increases where I think they were probably gonna like trickle along at like 0.25% before and maybe even like go a little more because I think he was very like intent on, uh, Powell was very intent on doing that. So yeah, and, I, and what I always say about it is like, it's gonna bottom before rate cuts. And we might not get a rate cut this year. Like the market is still pricing that in. Like the Fed has been pretty specific about that, not doing it. But personally, I think we might get a rate cut this year. But yeah, I just think that, um, I think that it's definitely something that I'm more optimistic that we're getting towards the bottom. Now, like that is assuming a non-severe recession. That's assuming that there's not more like bank collapse coming but I, I put in my newsletter, we are basically seeing like um, uh, liquidity strains on the banks less this week than last week. So we're trending in the right direction there. There is caveats there. But yeah, I mean, the stock market has already taken a huge hit. It's been a pretty extended bear market. We like, I forget what the stat is, but we rarely see two down years of the market in a row. So I do think, I do think we have some some recovery coming. There might be some more some more pain first, like yeah, based on I, I think the inflation is super important on that. Um, but I do think real estate is gonna feel some pain. Like I think just because I think especially like the stock market might be carried by like tech. I think places like I think like high risk assets, like I think crypto will start to recover. I think high tech will start to recover because it got like hit. So like even if we do face a fear a fierce recession, I think like consumer spending things. I think like retail could be hit harder. I think real estate is going to be hit harder just because, you know, there's going to be more people defaulting. There's a huge credit crisis. That's like, I think we're at an all time high in like personal credit and that's going to have impact, but I think it will have the most impact on, you know, places where uh, everyday people spend their dollars, which is sad. It's 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 sad that this is the place where our country's in, where we'd be like, oh, the stock market's gonna recover, but like people are gonna feel a lot of pain. But I do think that that's probably what's what's on the horizon. So I think we've yet to uh, they've yet to call us having a recession at all. And so if Jay Powell manages COVID and then post COVID without going through a recession, would that have been? as good of a job as he could have done as the Fed? Oh, I think he's done a fantastic job. Like, I, I, I really do. And I think he's like, I think not only has, uh, I mean, he was a little late on on the cuts, but like in his defense, inflation hadn't been a thing for us for like a very long, it's easy like to sit here as like Monday morning quarterback and be like, oh, you should have done more. But like, I also see the side where it's just like, America didn't really have it, like have inflation for a really, really long time. But I think since then, I think he's handled it. I think he's handled it well. And I think him like staying the course um, and being tough. And I, I would say, especially his tough talk around it, like not letting the the market rebound was really important. A lot, a lot of people don't know about this inflation that I think is like an alarming stat. 51% of it can be traced back to corporate profits. And in a typical inflationary cycle, that's about 10%. So like 
actually the most important job he had to do was stem the stock market. So, so I think he, he did effectively of that. I think he, he tamped down the enthusiasm without killing the economy. And so I think that right there is a fantastic, is a fantastic job. I, I believe we technically are in a recession though. It's weird. Like, you know, everybody's like, Oh, we're not like, we technically are in a recession. So it's like, I, I, I love that they're branding it. <laughs> it's been rebranded as not a recession. And he's just mm -hmm. like, he's just making up his own terms. Like where it's like the labor market's still strong. So it can't be a recession, but that's not how recessions are defined. Like definitionally we're in a recession. So like good job by him <laughs> to rebrand the recession. But like, again, I, 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 I like would agree. Like, I think we might get the soft landing that he's talking about. And yeah, I mean, I don't know, like, uh, you know, I don't know how in depth, like people understand macro or, but, but like, you know, basically the big concern is that even if you do enough to clamp down credit, like the concern, if labor stays strong is that the strong labor markets will continue to uh, keep prices up. And like labor has still stayed relatively strong. So there's some risk of that. Like personally, I think the soft landing might just look like a more extended, like they talk about the 2% target. To me, like it might, especially with this banking crisis, to me, it, it might just look like a slower descent of inflation. Like that's what, what I might see it as. And But like, yeah, like there could be like that, I think is the biggest risk. Like if the labor like if we're back in like if we're in like 0.25 percent or like we even get to zero and Powell sees like the labor market even if inflation is like trickling down but like the labor market gets really it like starts to recover i think we might go back up like i think he wouldn't hesitate to go back up do you think they kind of wanted inflation with the amount of debt that we're in can, what do you mean by wanted inflation? Sorry, I just want to make sure I'm answering the question correctly. Uh, to kind of inflate away the debt that we have as a country, if those dollars are worth less, you know. I don't think I don't think they I don't think they ever want inflation. Like especially like if you think about like if you think about voters, right? Like and those people that are afflicted, like you know, like how often did we see like people posting on social media about like gas prices? Like people hate inflation. Like it's like not a wise, even if it's wise from like a macro political strategy, it's a horrible micro political strategy. So like, I can't, like, I can't ever see them like wanting it. Now to your, like, to be more specific, like, do I think they could have been more aggressive to like really get rid of it? Like, yes, I do think they could have. But like I said, like, I think what people like, and I think the banking thing is a really good example of this. I think what people don't realize when like, you know, the Fed capitulates is like the Fed is having conversations with banks all the time. You know, much like we were talking about like the SEC, there's a lot of like commingling, commingle of ideas because they essentially have to run the economy together. Like the investment banks have a huge say in how our economy runs and like how the stock market does. And like, I'm not going to say if this was a direct conversation or it's more like reading between the lines. Like you always have to worry that like, okay, like let's say like the investment banks or hedge funds or whatever, like as this banking collapse happens, they could just basically be like, you know, read between the lines. If you don't fix this, we're just going to short the market <laughs> like to high hell because this is all going to collapse and it snowballs really fast. So like, the Fed kind of has to do something then. And that's always like for people that don't understand like the intrigue of like banking and like the, the like how powerful our investment banking system is and like even things like too big to fail. Like sometimes like that does exist. I would love to see better systems where that doesn't happen. But yeah, sometimes when you have like on that Monday when Powell was like, okay, we're going to reevaluate things on like, you know, about raising rates this year and everything. Like that was definitely out of genuine fear that the market would just get shorted and snowball and everything. And like, I wouldn't even consider that the fault of like institutions because it's like, yeah, if you're not gonna support the economy, that's the good trade. So like, 
either make that a less good trade for us or that's going to be the smart place to put our money and we're just going to load up on the futures markets like before you can even like before the market even opens all right so we have a few minutes left so i think one of the last things i want to ask is one of the companies i really like for the long term is block which just recently took a big L with Hindenburg coming out on a short report. I don't know if you saw it. How much credibility do you give companies like Hindenburg, who has a decent track record in the past, um, although their incentives are aligned to find problems with companies? So what do you make of them? I got to see what um, what they say in Prospero. I have my own opinions, but let's see. All right. It's looking good. It's looking good in Prospero. Good institutional flow, 72. Upside breakout, 76. Downside, 33. Profitability, 49. Growth, 58. So before you start, can I just ask you, in Prospero, it goes zero to 100. So is 50 like neutral and anything above is good? Anything below is average. bad? Okay. Yeah. And it's actually on a bell curve. So like the higher you go, like the more special you are in, okay. in the rating. So yeah, like mo the, the big chunk of the distribution is going to be between 40 and 60, obviously, like any bell curve. But yeah, no, that that's a very good, I, and I remember I've looked at this recently, like I, I think that's a strong, like, you know, I, I like when when more mature companies still have growth, like I think a 58 growth is, is, is pretty good. It's not, you know, it's not great. But yeah, I, I think they're, I think they're a good company. Like, obviously, there's there's a lot more long term options bets than than short term ones. And in terms of like Hindenburg or like, you know, anyone like, I would say that like my big thing is I don't read too much in, into like any institution and like what they're doing. Like I form my own thesis and this, it, it's a good company. Like outside, I wanted to just make sure I wasn't going to say something that Prospero disagreed with, but yeah, I, I, I think it's a good company. And like, I would say there's, I care if like Renaissance Technologies is invested in something like for sure. Two Sigma is another like fairly quantitative fund um, that I like. And I mean, probably Rentec more because they're more like they tend to be more like long term investors. Um, but everybody else, like a quick thing on like 10 Q, uh, like on um, a 13 Fs and, and, and Gs. Basically, like the Gs are when people take a big stake. Right. So those you can think a little more about because they're timely or di divest a big stake. But like what we know about institutional holdings, they report quarterly and they report what they want you to see. So like a company could look like they have a huge long position, but that's just what they want you and other people to see. And then like if you're talking about that, you can talk about like, OK, we never really know where institutions are invested. That's thing one. Thing two, if you're talking about like, what they're saying, they could want to just like pump it for two more dollars and then sell. Or they could want, like we're talking about drive down the price so they can enter at a, at a point. So I don't really put much credence into like, you know, what institutions say or even the positions that they show. That's another reason why I built Prospero to look at the options because options positions are honest. And maybe I can't see where the individual you know, institutions are putting their money, but I can, if I can see where the options are priced, I know what they really think on a grand level. But yeah, I would, I would guard against anyone like looking, like going on what positions institutions are showing or, or what people are saying, like, that's all just like, that's noise to me and should be noise to you. Focus on your own thesis um, and your own process. That's good to hear. Uh, well, thank you for coming on. I feel like I got a lot of value out of this. I hope people who watch this do as well. And I hope the best for Prosper in the future. It seems like a great company. And uh, yeah, thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. This was great. Yeah, you're welcome back anytime. All right. See you in the future. Have a great rest of your day. Bye. You too.